Bom, gente, vamos lá, vamos começar. É... Boa tarde, boa tarde a todos. Eu sou o Carlos Afonso, acho que, enfim, conheço grande parte do, do, do pessoal que, que comparece nessa, nessa tarde de hoje. É, queria dar as boas-vindas a, a vocês aqui nessa, nessa nossa tarde, dizer que hoje vamos fazer uma varanda um pouquinho, um pouquinho diferente. Essa é a nossa quinta varanda que fazemos aqui no, no ITS, só que essa varanda, paradoxalmente, não acontece na varanda. É, como vocês já perceberam, a gente hoje, por conta do, do tempo e do vento, optou por fazer um encontro, um encontro indoors, não, não na varanda, mas a gente faz uma dinâmica um pouquinho diferente. A gente faz, vamos fazer aqui as apresentações e os intervalo, no intervalo a gente passa para a varanda para um happy hour, para uma confraternização aqui com, com os nossos presentes. Essa é uma varanda muito especial e o Ronaldo vai falar um pouquinho mais dela, porque nessa varanda nós contamos com os nossos, com os nossos fellows que farão as apresentações de suas, de suas pesquisas. Só para passar um pouquinho da, da história para quem está vindo pela primeira vez nesses nossos, nesses nossos pequenos, pequenos encontros, no, desde o ano passado, nós começamos aqui com, com o ITS fazendo encontros na varanda sobre temas diversos envolvendo tecnologia, cultura, política. E com isso fizemos já uma série de encontros. Fizemos um primeiro encontro sobre governança da, da, da internet, recebendo o Adam Siegel do Council on Foreign Relations, para discutir a relação entre China e Estados Unidos na governança e na regulação da internet. Fizemos uma varanda para discutir questões ligadas à, à indústria a indústria criativa, a economia criativa, mais especificamente a questão da moda, uma varanda sobre, sobre Bitcoin, e aí chegamos aqui na nossa, na nossa varanda sobre temas diversos. Então, vou passar a palavra para o Ronaldo para apresentar um pouquinho o nosso programa dos Fellows e o que a gente vai, o que a gente vai discutir hoje. For the fellows who had not understand a single word that I was talking in, in, in the last two minutes, I was just introducing the, the, what the Varandas ITS is all about. And uh, now pass to Ronaldo to say some few words about the fellowship program and what do we expect for today. Obrigado, Caf. Bom, gente, é, vou mudar para o inglês, que hoje o evento vai ser em inglês. É, so, first of all, Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is a different varanda, as Carlos said. We actually try to put everything outside at the varanda of our center, but unfortunately it was very windy, so we were afraid that the screen would actually fly away and then we would have a big problem. So we decided to bring everything inside, but we are going to have like a happy hour outside with a craft beer, which is like a sort of a traditional Uh, thing for our events here. So it's really great because this is a different event. We have the privilege to have our ITS Global Fellows with us. So they are really amazing. Uh, I could spend like a lot of time telling you how interesting and how amazing their work is, but they will be doing that themselves. So you have actually the opportunity to hear uh, six very interesting uh, people working in a lot of contemporary issues, a lot of pressing things that have to do with everyone's lives. And they are also interested in Brazil as well. So they have been to Brasilia actually uh, last week. So it, they got a feel of how much uh, things actually work in the Brazilian government. Uh, I wonder if it was a, an interesting experience. I bet it was. And uh, they also will be going to Sao Paulo, also to see uh, the difference between Sao Paulo and Rio, of course. And I'm sure they will be back very shortly to Rio after that experience. And uh, so it's really great. And uh, I'm sure everyone will have the opportunity also to speak uh, informally during our uh, after hours, like uh, at the, the, the break that we will have, and also at the end of the conference. With that said, let me give the, the floor uh, to Alison Birch, uh, who will be the first presenter for our varanda. So thank you so much, Alison. And I hope you enjoy uh, this amazing thing that uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be having like this, this afternoon. So thank you so much. So, 
First thing I want to mention is like two experiences that I've had that have been informative to what I've made um, in the past couple years. And the first is this. This is, I have a dumpster diving blog. Does everyone know what dumpster diving is? Um, it's basically you dig in trash and find cool things. And I started it in California in 2010 because um, I heard these stories about, you know, there's so much waste in the United States. What is that like? And um, so I just started looking in the trash in behind grocery stores. And in fact, in the United States, they throw out 50% of everything that we've grown ends up in the trash. And so these are like perfectly good food, but for whatever reason, which we can go into later, they throw it out. This has been really formative for me in terms of what I think about the um, infrastructure and how um, it benefits the rich and not the poor in the United States and the growing class divide that I see. And then the second thing is that um, I was really involved in Occupy Wall Street. I actually made um, the newspaper on the left, the Occupied Wall Street Journal. And um, this was also a, a huge impact on me in regards to uh, what it looks like to participate democratically with a group of people and then how the state responds even when you're doing stuff that is legal within the law democratic a group of people rich and poor coming together and then um, what we faced was essentially a nationwide crackdown that happened at the same night that you know beat us up and so this really affects how i view um, the intersection between the private sector and the public and what is democracy, especially in America, when um, people get together and act, and act democracy and then they get beat up, is that what, whose, whose interests um, does the government serve? So now my biggest question is how do I make stuff as an artist, as a creative technologist, how do I make stuff in a world that's messed up? How do we make stuff when we don't need more stuff, when, um, I see so many things that are horrible and I want to make them better. What is our response to this? Um, and then most importantly, how do I frame the questions that I ask myself about what I make? So the first thing that I've been um, pushing against is this idea of tech solutionism, which is that you take a problem and you add more technology and then sometimes that problem will get better, which I, I disagree with. Um, Evgeny Morozov, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's um, an, an author that deals a lot with that idea. Um, but uh, he calls it algorithmic regulation also, that it offers us this good old technocratic utopia of politics without politics. So when you start getting into um, this idea that, you know, is, if we can have more data, algorithmically regulate everything, um, you these algorithms are built by certain people and they serve certain people. Um, and so I just, I, I generally am very um, critical of this idea of tech solutionism um, because democracy itself should be our goal, not, not more technology. And then this, this is a quote from this German guy named Johannes Grenzfurther that privacy is a bourgeois fantasy um, and that it's only those who are privileged who can really be concerned with privacy, um, that those without privilege are, you know, that's, that's the least of their concerns. Also, um, we actually want those who are invisible to be more visible. And so this idea of separating the public or what's, you know, everyone wants to be private, um, what we actually need is um, some people to to be more public and, and how do we like like the Marco civil was this very public action which was awesome um, you know how can that if, if everyone's private no one can can have that conversation so am I speaking too fast by the way okay um, so the next idea I want to propose to you is this idea of liberation technology and as I've been building my thesis work in the past two years, I, um, I, I came up with a new definition for this. Um, and so as I'm defining it, it's technology that exists to liberate people from unjust economic, political, or social conditions. It's an invitation to remain emotionally present. So I don't know if you've been checking your Twitter these days, but everything's horrible in the world right now. Um, and so liberation technology is neither an escapist fantasy, nor is it debilitating min misery. Um, but it's an invitation to have this sort of open-handedness 
about life where we f refuse to give people the choice of freedom without happiness or happiness without freedom. Um, and that, that comes from Ursula K. Le Guin. And then the last thing about liberation technology that I want to bring up is that it doesn't exploit the many to profit the few. So if you take a look at um, tech company these days, uh, I'm very suspicious of um, who, who creates these algorithms and who they ultimately profit. Um, Twitter just came out with the demographics of their employees. They're 90% male, 88% um, are wider Asian, similar to Facebook and LinkedIn, um, it hovers around 85 to 90% male. Um, and, and these are all, you know, I'm just saying that there's many more people in the world that I think we should be suspicious of the algorithms and who these are, who these are ultimately helping. Um, so a question I want to ask is how do we create equal access to information? Um, one thing that I, a, a project I made, and so, okay, so now I'm going to get into the things I've made. I've like, I'm done with the, these sorts of questions and I'll show you some projects. So one project I made was um, something called the Dumb Store, which you can go to that website if you want. And um, back in the States, I still have a dumb phone, which I don't know if that makes sense, but like it's not a smartphone, so it's not a computer. Um, and I made this about two years ago, and uh, basically I still wanted to access some parts of the internet from my phone, but I didn't want to carry around a GPS, a, like a huge computer, all this stuff with me. Um, and also, I'm very suspicious of this idea of planned obsolescence, where people have to constantly buy, buy new stuff, buy new stuff, buy new stuff. Your you know, operating system slows down right before the hardware comes out. Um, so the dumb store, you can text and get Wikipedia information, subway information, um, and it's all open source. So this is a side note, but um, the Apollo 11 had four kilobytes of RAM. For comparison, your iPhone 5 has one gigabyte of RAM, which is a million kilobytes. So basically, you're carrying around like 250,000 times the computing capacity than what it take what it took to go to the moon, which is mind blowing to me. So like we have, I, smartphones are awesome, and I'm not hating on them at all. Um, <laughs> like that's that's incredible, but um, I. We have so much, and I think we're the the bigger question is what do we do with what we have versus like how do we constantly get more RAM? Um, so these are some other things on the dumb store. So like I made a couple of the apps, but um, when we released it, it got on Hacker News, and like people from all over the world made these apps that they wanted. It's all open source, and and people still do it or s still use it every day. Uh, so. Then another question I have, after, after you have all this information, um, uh, we have this like constant inundation with so much all the time. Um, what do we do with this awareness? And it's a complicated state of needing to know more versus um, complete and utter information overload. Um, so this is getting to some stuff in the United States. I don't know if this is as much of a problem here, but um, in the US, we have like, we're getting Wi Fi everywhere. So it's like there's Wi Fi. The bottom picture is Canada. They're putting Wi Fi in all of their national parks. And like the airlines used to be this like safe space where you would take a break, but now uh, you can talk on your phone all the time. It's the same with the subway in New York City that they're all becoming these hot spots. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, Sorry. Yeah. All right. Anyways, I'm not going to see my notes. That's fine. Um, so basically, we're at a pl we're at a place where everyone is um, constantly expressing themselves. Everyone's constantly, uh, you know, connected wherever they are. Um, and who cares if you have all this information if we're unable to deal with it emotionally? How can we change anything if we can't work together, or talk to each other? Um, so in my mind, the problem isn't actually getting people to express themselves. It's giving them any gap or space um, where they eventually might
find something to say. So I made a log jammer. Um, and it's a cell phone jammer in the, a log in the woods. Um, it provides a safe space in order to be alone. Um, so it's like there's a quote from Deleuze. It's what a relief it is to have the right to say nothing, because only then is there a chance of framing the rare, the thing that might be worth saying. And in the U.S we often disguise urban infrastructure as natural, so that the left is a cell phone ta tower, but um, what I did is the opposite, where I put a real tree in real woods and put a jammer in it. Um, are you guys that interested in how I made this? Oh, really? Okay. Okay, I'll get into that then. Um, so this uh, operates on the GSM spectrum, about GSM 1900. Um, and I, I chose 1900 just because that's what my cell phone was on. And um, I found a schematic that I uh, designed in Eagle, which is an, a free software that you can get online. And then the bottom part, I milled and drilled um, on a Roland. It's a mini CNC. Um, and I went through dozens of iterations of making these PCBs. They're called um, printed circuit boards. Uh, let me see. If, ah. So, yeah, so you basically do that stuff. <laughs> um, and then I have a video that may work. Ah, whoa, I don't want the audio to work, though. So I'm not going to show you that. Um, but basically what it does is it, um, I pr was proving that it works. Okay, and I'll move on from that. Um, so how do we communicate with each other? So it's, I, I feel like I'm trying to offer you like these two sort of conflicting ideas, but not an either or, but a both and, that we both need this time to be alone, but we also need to have these secure forms of communication. So a third project I made is, um, I called it Spike, and um, it's an in-browser video chat application. Um, and so you can, this is actually one of the things I want to work on this week is to make it better. But there are many options if you don't want to download an application to chat with each other, um, like talkie.io, all these different things where you can just send someone a link in the browser and then video chat using WebRTC, web real-time communication, instead of um, going through um, one of the NSA technologies like Microsoft or Google. Um, and that's another example. And then the fourth uh, project that I want to present is um, it's calling out some bullshit on the internet. And so we're suffering from this problem where we have information overload, like I told you about before, but um, we don't know how to trust. And then we're also giving up our privacy every time we access the internet. So um, this next project is called the Internet Illuminator. And what it is is a Firefox add-on that illuminates uh, corporate and political infrastructure um, and the relationships that are often unknown. So it basically iterates through all the text in your HTML browser. And whenever it finds a person or corporation um, from the data I have, it illuminates that relationship. Um, so. This is an example of uh, Tumblr that you see that it was acquired by Yahoo. Um, and I focus on tech acquisitions, tech acquisitions, uh, brands that own everything, um, and then people who sit on the boards of Fortune 1000 companies. So Oculus. So what the, everything in yellow, it's not actually highlighted, but it's just in parentheses. Um, and I did that because I wanted it to be subtle and not like, hey, look at my add-on. It's so awesome. But just like, you know, show you information. Um, or other companies that are owned by everything. Um, or, you know, board members um, that... This guy happens to be on the board of Walmart and Goldman Sachs, which is a double whammy. Um, just to clarify power structures, because I think that pe it's so hard with how much information we have to um, get clarity in these things. So I will finish with um, this idea again that liberation technology exists to liberate people from unjust economic, political, or social conditions. Um, 
and it's something that's a work in progress for me that I want to continue with. So thank you for listening and for offering me this chance to speak here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that I think we should do is actually to take the, all the questions at the end. So let's everyone present and then we do like a big round of questions for everyone. So with that said, uh, let me give the floor to Kate Contreras. Am, am I pronouncing your name correctly? It's very Contreras. I'm sorry for that. That's a tough one for Portuguese speakers. So, uh, so Kate, please. Um, cool. Thanks for coming, everybody, um, particularly the people I don't know. This is very kind of you to show up. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here in Brazil, and um, great thanks to the ITS Rio team for inviting all of us to be here and have an incredible three-week experience that's um, really been very valuable educationally for me, at least. Um, thank you, Aleishu. No, no problem. Um, cool. Um, okay, can everybody? Awkward. Okay, let's get started. So, um, uh, so my name is Kate Crontiris, and I work independently as a researcher and strategist and facilitator um, in the U.S., mostly around issues of civic life in America. Um, and by civic, um, I think we mean things that relate to kind of public decision making, public problem solving, could be legislative, it could be community based. Um, but that's the focus of the work that I do. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about a methodology that I use as a researcher known as ethnic ethnography, sometimes it's known as user-centered research or human-centered research. It has elements of journalism in it, um, but it's a social science methodology. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I do with it and why it can be valuable for public problem solving um, and give a couple of case examples of, of how um, I've used it um, in, in, the, in the past. So. Um, just to start off, um, ethnography, it's a word that comes from the Greek and it uh, combines two different notions. Ethno is the idea of folk or nation or people and um, uh, grapho or graph is, is I write. So it's basically the sort of systematic study of cultures and um, people. And the important thing about ethnography is that it, it, it aims to look at society from the point of view of the subject of the study. Um, and so, we're looking at all kinds of different cultural phenomena, uh, social or societal phenomena from the perspective of the people whom it influences. Um, and so in order to do that as a social science methodology, you need to get really close with the subject, with the people. So it's a, um, an approach that's sort of been pioneered out of the biological and social and cultural branches of um, anth anthropology um, and, f and sort of familiar in the social sciences generally. And the idea is that you collect your data alongside the people that you are studying, right? So you go live in the communities that they live in. You work um, with them at their jobs. You live with them in their homes. You do your best to kind of embed yourself in um, kind of naturally occurring settings that are appropriate for the sort of theme that you're trying to study. Um, so it relies very heavily on kind of up close and personal experience. It's about sort of participating in the dynamics of everyday life, not just observing it from the outside. Um, and I guess by public problem solving, um, I'm referring to a kind of uh, broad set of ideas that's on the one hand about civic engagement, on the one hand about citizens or residents of a place engaging themselves with government, but I'm also talking about citizens or residents of a place engaging together among themselves um, in order to solve some problem that is meaningful for the public good in some way. Um, and so um, in this instance, 
we're talking about the ability for different kinds of actors to collaborate together, but also for people to have the self-efficacy to solve problems when they identify them, where they identify them. Um, so just by way of um, background, as an undergraduate in university, I studied sociology, which is one of the sort of social sciences that uses this methodology under a gentleman named Herbert Gans, um, who is really famous for his work, most famous for his work on urban renewal. Um, and so he, his sort of first study in the early 60s was about an area of Boston, which is where I live, called the West End, um, which was mainly in a kind of Italian-American working class community um, until you know, people who lived in this area that was categorized by a slum by the local government sort of displaced from their neighborhood. So um, he spent a number of years living and working among the residents of this neighborhood to understand what the place meant to them and to kind of track this sort of displacement. So um, my first ethnographies were strange. Um, my first, um, the first study that I did was about uh, musicians and performers underground, literally in the New York City subway system. People who do it formally, they're like given permission by the city, but also people who just claim their own space for the great acoustics or for the money that they can make from people underneath um, going through this sort of mode of transportation. And also my, my sort of thesis was about um, groups of women who would um, get together and then take off their clothes and then take a picture of um, a, their protest, their naked protest in um, sort of against the Iraq war and trying to understand what was it about this form of protest that they thought was so significant and meaningful, um, if at all. So more recently, I've done some other kinds of, of studies. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Tunisia right after the revolution. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit to try and understand um, how one might invest in technology after the revolution to support social cohesion and economic development or traveling all around the country. Um, uh, I've done some work on the administration of elections in the United States, so this would be more sort of institutional ethnography. We'll also talk about that. And then most recently, I've been traveling across the US to learn um, what motivates everyday Americans to do things that are civic or to get involved in their communities in some way. Um, so I'll just say that I'm also interested not just in the sort of study of these phenomena, but also um, let's do something about it. I'm interested in kind of problem solving as an end goal. So the work that I do is applied, um, which means that um, we're using it for some, to design some policy or to design a program or to design a physical space or to design a technology product. So I also have some background in uh, public policy and also in business. Okay, so just to start off with the question about how ethnography is used in non-academic contexts, I thought I would just sort of start there. Um, uh, so obviously we see it a lot, you know, people do their PhD using ethnographic methods on all different kinds of topics, but many companies use this mode of research to understand consumer behavior. Um, this is a picture from um, Intel, the technology company Intel. Um, and they basically have a staff of cultural anthropologists led by a woman named Genevieve Bell um, who go out into the world and study all different kinds of things. And this particular study was about how drivers use technology. So she went around and asked all different drivers to empty the contents of their car. So she has like a hundred different pictures like this of all the things that people have in their cars, looking at artifacts for clues as to how people use technology when they're driving. Um, uh, you would never, for example, see a Nike shoe or an Adidas shoe that hadn't um, been researched and kind of user tested really rigorously before it was sold to a consumer. Companies like IDEO and Frog provide these services um, professionally, commercially to all different kinds of organizations under the name of sort of design research or user-centered research. So There's a methodology that has been repurposed in the kind of corporate sector pretty rigorously. 
Um, institutions of development, aid development, um, are also starting to use it as a way to design programs and to design funding mechanisms. Um, the research that I mentioned uh, in Tunisia was funded by the World Bank as a way to understand how they should target their technology investments. This is a backpack from a project that UNICEF did with a company called Frog, which provides these services to all kinds of different organizations. Um, so the question here was to try and understand something about the real world needs of community health workers. And so they went and did research in, I believe, Uganda and Senegal to understand what sort of the obstacles were to doing that job really well. Um, and they learned a bunch of different things. And But based on this research, they designed a sort of toolkit, which is what you see here. Um, I don't know what all the component parts are, but it's all in that backpack. Um, of different kind of physical, digital, and service level components that would help them be more effective as community health workers. So, and particularly in the development context, we've seen this methodology used to try and design products or program or funding streams in order to improve some sort of development issue in the world. Um, and then finally, when we're thinking of institutions of governance, this is just finally starting to catch on as well in some institutions of governance. The UK is a really good example of this. This is a screenshot from the new uh, gov.uk um, website, which is now the homepage of the UK government and part of a huge overhaul in thinking for the for the government as a whole to think about how it delivers services and thinking about integrating digital as a component to every single service that they provide to citizens in the country. Not just things you do online, but things that are related to the processes of justice, things that are related to health care, things that are related to voter registration, um, all different types of things. Um, and one thing that's really cool about what they've done, you can see at the top, it says Government Service Design Manual. They've actually distilled what they're doing into a set of principles so that other governments can think about the delivery of services using these kinds of um, human-centered, user-centered, ethnographic methodologies. Um, so they're using ethnographic research to, quote, understand real-life behavior as they continue to think about what products will be most useful for um, citizens in the country. Um, this is a mall not too far away. I took this picture the other day. Um, and I just, I I'm put it here just to bring back into mind that, um, you know, humans are humans, right? Like, we go to the mall, we eat food, we're reading the newspaper, we're having a conversation with our friend, we're complex, interesting creatures. Um, and so when we think about the value of ethnography for public problem solving, I just want to highlight a couple of reasons why I think it's useful as we think about the kinds of public problem solving that the Marco Civil, for example, represents um, in terms of societal and social justice kinds of issues. So ethnography offers really rich and specific um, information about how everyday people live their lives, what they believe, what they aspire to, what their constraints are, the kind of information that um, you don't get by asking somebody to answer a multiple choice question um, in a survey. So uh, when we want to know why any group of people is doing something or not doing something, ethnography is a way of going to the source, talking to the people themselves about what they're experiencing, triangulating what you hear from them with your observations, um, from other interviews with other people so that you can get to some notion of the truth, um, and understanding kind of behavior from the human subject's perspective. So in public problem solving, that kind of information helps us design public services, programs, programs, laws, policies, technologies, any set of different things that are really vital for how society functions so that they're aligned more directly with actual users' needs. Um, Allison was referring to this idea of tech solutionism just previously, which is the idea that, oh, we'll just throw whatever we think is the right thing at the problem and it'll probably be fixed. And this methodology brings back to the fore the idea of, well, let's ask the people who we think we are solving the problems for um, what they would actually design for themselves. Um, so this means that it allows us to target our public programming or legislation more effectively, certainly, and sometimes more cheaply as well. Um, I also just want to be clear about what ethnography or ethnographic methods are not, um, just to be clear. So they can be used for any scale of research. In academic context, people spend three or four years living or working in a particular community or on a particular topic, so extended period of time. In the applied context, which is often where I find myself, we have three months, six months if we're lucky, to kind of 
of find out something and do something with it. And so that means that our sample sizes are smaller, between 10 and 100 interviews, depending on kind of the resources and the constraints. Um, so what that means is that ethnographic methods are really best for uncovering what I would call qualitative signals, right, of getting some sense of any set of dynamics at play in the population. It's not a means of getting usually statistically significant survey data about what is representative in a population. So ethnography gets uh, sailed or qualitative research in general, in general, if you're not doing it over three or five years for being something that, you know, well, you can't say this represents the whole population. You cannot. But it's useful for understanding what some of the dynamics are so that maybe you can then follow up with quantitative methods to understand what's actually representative of a population. Um, um, so it's really best at the beginning of a project or at the beginning of a problem-solving process to understand what specifically is kind of some of the dynamics at play to debunk any myths that you may have or to understand some constraints. Um, and like any other research methodology, it has its biases as well, and notably the fact that as a researcher, you embed yourself in the lives of other people, and you do that to collect data, but the act of doing that also means that you um, have an influence surely on what people say and, and how they react to you and what they do. Very often people want to impress, we want to impress each other, right? So we want to answer a question in a way that uh, looks favorable to us instead of a way that's really representative of what we believe or how we act. Um, so what's important in, in this kind of methodology, as I said, is to kind of triangulate against a couple of different um, sources of data to be able to really understand what's closest to the truth. The benefit, of course, is that you're able to know this depth of information about something that's much more valuable um, in some instances than a kind of surface level understanding that you get from, from survey data. Okay, so I just want to give a few examples of this um, work. Um, so in the <laughs> this one, Kate. Sorry for that. No, no problem. Um, can you guys hear me? No, that effect was so fun, though. <laughs> it's a little bit worse. That's better. Okay. Can you record that? Okay, cool. If we're in the back, just can talk with a key. I think Javier has put a key. He has one time. Can you play chat? So I'm going to um, offer a couple of case studies of this methodology just to give a flavor of like what it looks like and how it's used. I'm going to try to go through the question that we were trying to answer, something about the approach that we took, a little bit about what we learned and what kind of came out of this. So um, in the context of post-revolutionary Tunisia, um, myself and a research partner were engaged by the World Bank to understand something, as I mentioned, about how they might invest in technology. This is a bit of tech solutionism, but it's good they were using ethnography to kind of vet their assumptions. How would we invest in technology so that we could support kind of positive outcomes in that country after all of this political and social flux? And so we were looking at um, how, how is it that actually institutions themselves in Tunisia, be they social, civic, or governmental, actually use technology to improve their efficiency and effectiveness as organizations, to improve public engagement, to improve service delivery, um, and general accountability. We were wondering how policymakers and investors, so not just government entities, but potentially um, private sector investors could make and structure technology investments or initiatives so that it could spur economic development and general innovation in the country. Um, and how might, uh, and this might be a question of more interest to this kind of community, but how could we use technology sit in, it, among citizens in the media or in sort of civic institutions to encourage social cohesion or to try and build some resilience in the population in this moment of flux? And so, 
we went all across the country uh, talking with people in depth, observing um, how they lived their lives uh, among 130 different Tunisians, including activists, government workers, farmers, um, students, you name it. We talked to a whole variety of different people in a, quite a number of different locations across the country. So if you're familiar with Tunisia there uh, as a legacy of um, this, their sort of governing system in the past 30 to 50 years or so. There are a number of places that were very wealthy, very well established, people living very comfortable lives, and a number of other places where people were really living at or below the poverty level. Um, and so we discovered, or, or sort of, un, I guess, surfaced from this research, um, aspects of kind of regional disparity remaining a really central challenge to social cohesion, that this difference in experiences across the population was gonna be a big challenge to confront front, um, that, that the sort of small and medium-sized enterprises were really poised for growth, but in many instances needed um, financing, larger and more targeted streams of financing, um, better digital infrastructure, um, better workforce development so that people arrived at the companies really ready to work and not in a need of a year or year and a half of training in order to do their jobs. Um, at the end, various other elements around the education system, around sort of um, civic life in the country, and in terms of kind of the online communities. That was perhaps most interesting about being there, that um, the online communities that kind of grew under the authoritarian state that were there were really providing the foundation for a new civil society in the country. Um, and many of the people who were involved in those communities were sort of would-be entrepreneurs, people who, with the right sort of um, support and um, investment in their skills and their interests could really help create either technology platforms or communities that could support all of these things. Um, and as I mentioned, this research was used to inform how the bank actually made multi-million dollar investments in the country um, after the revolution. So that's kind of a country level uh, way of thinking about the value of ethnography. This example um, is more, as I mentioned, institutional ethnography. So. Um, this is a woman who works in an elections office in, in America, and um, this research was for a small civic technology nonprofit called TurboVote, which in the United States is trying to make it um, as easy for people to register to vote as it is to watch a movie on Netflix. Um, and this is actually a challenge because the processes for registering to vote and voting in the U.S. are different literally everywhere. There's not a standard process. There's not a standard machine that you use. There aren't standard deadlines. It's different everywhere. Um, and so... Um, they had been pretty successful in helping people get registered to vote and were interested in thinking about how could they help elections offices be more voter centric? How could they help bring these elections offices into the 21st century and really provide services that would meet the way people live their lives now? Um, so the question that we were answering here is sort of what are the human motivations technological systems and institutional landscapes that affect the administration of elections. So just to be specific, the users that we were looking at here were actually people who work in government. They weren't necessarily everyday voters. They were the people who run elections across the country. Um, and so similarly, we traveled to six different places, six different states in the country, a variety of sort of geographic, demographic, political um, kind of leanings and uh, did both contextual observation. We asked people to show us their technology, to sit down and look at the technologies that they're using, to talk us through who they have to get approvals uh, from in order to spend money or to purchase technology. Um, we watched them as they registered people to vote. This is really embedding in the work of what these elections offices do. Um, and um, I, on the whole found that many of the elections offices that we visited were staffed with innovative entrepreneurial people who were constrained by um, a number of different technological and institutional factors. So they're using very often technology that was custom made and is pretty crappy, but it's reliable, so they still use it. Um, and uh, uh, in institutional environments where they need to get seven different permissions from different agencies to do anything that's innovative, and yet they viewed every election cycle as an opportunity to test something new. Um, so it was interesting to see all these innovations and see them also occur in isolation. And we're hopeful that TurboVote can help um, kind of bring those ideas together and bubble them up for greater use across the United States. Um, the outcome of this project is actually um, what we learned from elections officials um, it was a specific need as a ballot tracking tool. So 
This would be some sort of technology um, using intelligent mail barcodes. You can scan in the US where things are in some sort of mail chain through the postal system using barcodes. This allows you to um, know when an absentee ballot, uh, so people can, you can vote by mail if you're not in person in the state where you live when there's an election. You can, you know, fill out your ballot by mail and mail it into the office. And so this is a tool that allows you to track exactly where your ballot is from the time it leaves the, um, the office to the time it gets to your house to the time it goes back into the mail to the time it's received at the office and actually counted. And this is valuable for elections officials because they also have challenges with the US postal system and want to know where all of these ballots that they're going to be responsible for actually are. Very small, simple idea, right? So in terms of thinking about reimagining the entire elections administration process in the United States, that's a really big challenge. But a very specific idea that came from specific ethnographic research is something they're acting on right now um, in time for the 2016 presidential election. And this is my most recent research that I'm um, going to do my best to tell you as much as I can about it and then say wait for the fall to find out the full results of it. But um, this is uh, ethnography used for a thematic purpose. So the first one was sort of country level. The second one was institutional. This is used to understand a theme or a general sort of question. Um, so I've been doing research supported by Google. They have a sort of civic innovation group in the company to try and understand um, what is it that motivates everyday Americans to get involved in civic or public life. Um, and so what we see in the U.S. is that um, only half the population votes. It's not required to vote in the U.S. It's voluntary. So only about half the population votes at a presidential election. Forget all of the other local elections that happen much more regularly that actually influence um, the kind of budget priorities of the area where you live. And um, However, what we've learned is that people volunteer at really high numbers. They're doing a lot of volunteering. They're, doing, they're signing a lot of petitions. How do we understand what motivates people to do any one of these things or not do these things? Um, so the questions there, we're trying to understand their motivations and also their barriers for action, and also to try and understand how they perceive government. How do they perceive their role in relation to their government? Um, so we visited five different cities, again, various in terms of their geography and politics and demographics, um, and talked with more than 100 people in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta, Phoenix, and some in Boston as well. Um, and in terms of what we found, that's coming. We're going to publish it online in the fall. Um, and we're currently doing a sort of second round of quantitative research. As I mentioned, it's nice to pair qualitative and quantitative. We're doing a round of quantitative research to really assess if what we found is representative in the population as a whole, or if it's something that's it's sort of um, there and sort of a dynamic at play, but not necessarily representative. So we're doing some quantitative research to build on what we've learned qualitatively. Um, the outcome here is, um, is twofold. One is public facing, so we want to be able to share everything that we've learned with the community of people in the United States and abroad um, who are interested in these same questions um, so that they can also be designing technology products or services that are really attuned to what everyday citizens or residents actually want and need. Um, the research is also going to be used internal to Google. They have a whole variety of different sort of civic-facing products that they have already rolled out, some that are under development, and so their research will inform how those um, products are designed as well. So I think I've come to the end of my um, time here. Um, I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Again, I just want to thank ITS Rio and all of you for your kind attention. Well, uh, before I hand the floor to Primavera, I just would like to say that, uh, like all the varandas that we organize, this one is being recorded. So if you do not want to show up in video or your voice, do not make questions. So you still have time to do that. Uh, and everything is going to be actually posted on YouTube. So if you're interested in the previous events that we have organized, everything is online. So as Carlos said, We've had discussions about virtual currencies, like Bitcoin. We had like a, a Congress member, Alessandro Molon, come in here to discuss the Marco Civil. We had uh, discussions about cybersecurity. So make sure that you take a look at our YouTube channel. With that said, 
Let me give the floor to Primavera de Filippi, who's going to talk about her research and work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hi, I'm Primavera de Filippi. I'm a researcher at the CNRS in Paris, and uh, I'm currently a fellow at the Bergman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. So today I'm going to talk about the Internet of Things, and I will focus in particular on how this um, situation of mass surveillance that uh, we are currently experiencing on the Internet might actually turn out to be even more critical when it is transposed in the physical world. Okay. So, first of all, what is the Internet of Things? Uh, basically, the idea is to turn everyday objects into smart objects, which are connected to a particular network and which can communicate with each other. So, in order to be smart, an object needs to be able to do at least three things. One, it needs to be able to sense its surroundings. Two, it needs to be able to uh, communicate and to receive information about its surroundings. And then three, it needs to be able to act according to the information that it has collected or received. Oops. Okay. Um, so the Internet of Things provide a lot of benefits to end user most of which are related to uh, increasing efficiency and to providing a more customized or personalized service to the end user. So one of the most obvious benefits is that it allows people to control their own houses or their own devices from afar. And this can be done by deploying specific sensors that uh, communicate through the internet uh, such as, for instance, the Samsung drop cam that can be used in order to supervise your house, or the motor device which uh, comes with a, a general purpose programmable sensor that can be used to monitor anything in the house. And then sometimes the smart device can also be remotely controlled through the internet by means of specific applications, such as, for instance, the Apple HomeKit, or basically any kind of smartphone-based application. Now, this kind of supervision actually becomes less necessary when we introduce automation. And so we can see nowadays uh, a lot of new devices which are programmable, such as, for instance, the Nest, which is a smart thermostat that basically is going to keep your house cool or warm according to the settings, but that also learn about your habits so that it will only um, warm out your house when it knows that you're actually going to be in there. And then we have, for instance, the, the Kiwi set lock that allows people to remotely and digitally open or close doors, um, either from local or from afar. And then, of course, we have all the new emerging self-driving cars, which will bring you exactly where you want to be, according to the route that they consider to be the most efficient. And then all those automated devices can actually be integrated into a more sophisticated ecosystem whose value is actually greater than the sum of all of its parts. And so we can imagine, for instance, um, an alarm clock that communicates with your coffee machine and that will delay the coffee whenever the alarm is put on snooze. Or, for instance, you can have a refrigerator that will connect to the Internet and automatically order new groceries before they actually run out. And then, of course, we have personalization. So whether this is done by means of uh, your smartphone that is automatically monitoring most of all your activities, or uh, wearable devices that are actually tracking your body functions, or intelligent refrigerators which are learning about your eating habits, all those devices are essentially designed in order to provide a more customized and personalized services to the user. And so this might lead us to conclude that the more information we are willing to share, 
then the better our experience will be. But the question is whether this is actually the case. So in spite of all those benefits, the Internet of Things actually has um, important drawbacks, which can either be necessary trade-off in the sense that they are necessary in order for the service to work, or which are unintended consequence in the sense that they have simply not been properly addressed by the people who designed the system. So one important problem is obviously privacy. So the situation is becoming relatively critical in the sense that um, everything we do, whether this is online or offline, is actually being collected by multiple sensors or devices. And so the problem here is that this is actually quite difficult to avoid because in order to work properly, most of our smart devices actually need to learn things about us. And so this raised the interesting question of how can we draw the distinction between what constitutes actually personalization or customization and what is instead more like target advertisement. And then are actually those two things merging or blurring into each other in this new integrated ecosystem. And so the, the main issue here is that we need to understand exactly who controls our data and in particular, whether our data is actually safe from unauthorized access by third parties. And so this is obviously quite related to the issue of security. So if any device that is actually connected to the internet is inherently insecure, then malicious users could try and hack into the system in order to get hold of uh, sensitive data, or they could try and uh, alter the functionalities of our devices, or simply they could try and corrupt the system by introducing some kind of virus or uh, malware. And then there is the question of integration, which might either be a good thing or a bad thing, according to how it's being used. And so we can imagine, for instance, if we get sick and then our wearable device automatically call our doctor so that we can actually get a proper treatment. So in this case, this is obviously a good thing. But then what if instead of calling our doctor, uh, our wearable device will actually connect to Google, which will then come back to us with a a really beautiful customized advertisement proposing us to purchase the drugs that we need. Or even worse, we could imagine that uh, our wearable device actually communicates directly with our insurance company. And then we will find out eventually that our insurance premium has been increased according to our sickness. So this is obviously less good. Um, and then another problem of integration is that it might lead to a situation where one service becomes dependent upon another service. And so a company could actually eventually leverage its power over one service in order to get users to do things that they would otherwise not do, such as Google. <laughs> and then there is also the problem of excessive automation, which might lead to us losing control over our own devices. So let's imagine, for instance, what will happen if um, the controller or perhaps just a sensor breaks down and the device could no longer be manually operated by the user. Or what if the, the device has actually been designed in order to act in one particular way, which we might not always agree with. So for instance, um, so we could imagine a fridge which actually has been designed so that it will only open its door at a particular um, period of time. Or we could imagine a car that will refuse to drive us anywhere when it knows that we should actually be at work, or perhaps if it thinks that we have been drinking too much. Or even worse, we could imagine uh, that someone might hack into our car and then we could no longer control where it's going. So all those issues actually raise really interesting legal challenges, uh, some of which are actually new, but others are old, but might actually acquire a whole new interest in this new context. So the first obvious challenge is surveillance. So the question here is um, how much data can be collected 
and most importantly, to what extent the data which has been collected about us can actually be used against us. So, again, taking a, the example of the car, the car might collect a lot of information about where we have been, about where we are going, and about how fast we are going. So, could the police actually tap into this information in order to eventually issue speeding tickets? Or, for instance, could a court actually require the disclosure of this information in order to figure out where we were located at a particular moment in time? And then, the most interesting thing with the Internet of Things is that the data that is collected about us could actually be used to enforce the law even before a tort has actually been made. So it's the minority report style. Um, so instead of collecting data in order to issue a speeding ticket, then the car could actually be designed so that it cannot drive over maximum speed. Or it could, for instance, be designed so that it will not start un unless you can show that you have a valid driving license and that your uh, security belt has been plugged. Um, in the same way, in terms of exposed enforcement, we could imagine that buildings are actually made to use specific locks, which will automatically lock people in whenever they are found guilty of a particular crime. And then, even beyond law enforcement, um, smart devices can actually constrain our behavior to the extent that they try to anticipate our needs. And so in this sense, they could actually reduce the opportunity for choice because they basically take a decision on our own behalf. So again, we can imagine, um, for instance, a fridge that is programmed to promote a healthy diet and uh, will therefore nudge us into purchasing healthy food. Um, or we could have the fridge refusing to open its door as, as long as we didn't do uh, a sufficient amount of exercise for the day, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> or a television, for instance, which might only propose us with a specific selection of programs to watch, or perhaps that will actually refuse to play some programs whenever some kids are around. But then, what if instead of using technology in order to enforce the law by either facilitating or precluding certain uh, activities, then what if technology was instead used to implement an integrated ecosystem where every single one of our action was monitored, assessed, and regulated by a particular algorithm? So instead of issuing speeding tickets, then we could say, for instance, that uh, the faster you drive, then the higher the price will be for the gas. Or we could say that the price that every individual has to pay for healthcare will depend on what kind of food they have eaten and how much exercise they have done through their life. And so this might lead to a situation where um, the rule of law are actually being replaced by algorithmical rules that might either reward or punish citizens according to whether they have been behaving as good or bad citizens in society. So this is what I call here algorithmic governance or uh, ambient law, in the sense that society will no longer be regulated by a particular set of laws which apply equally to everyone, but rather it will be regulated by these integrated ecosystem of interconnected device that will determine for every individual what they can or cannot do and at what cost. And the problem, of course, is that those rules are generally implemented by private entity or corporation, which are not subject to the standard uh, democratic scrutiny than the legislator is. And so this is actually closely related to the very difficult issue of responsibility. So who is actually liable for the damages which have been caused by a smart device? 
So according to traditional product liability rules, then the producer is liable for any bugs in the product, whereas the user is responsible for misusing it. Now, the problem is that with the Internet of Things, we're actually in a situation where we have smart devices which are interacting with a multiplicity of other devices and people, often in a really unexpected way. And so the causality chain becomes so long and complicated that it becomes virtually impossible to precisely determine who should be held liable for what. And so the obvious solution would be to consider that the device itself should be held uh, responsible for its own actions. So this means that for any damage that has not been caused either by a bug in the product or by the fact that someone was actually misusing that product, then the smart device should actually be able to pay for the damages that he has caused through its own pocket. And in fact, there is actually an easy way to do that. So the solution is to set up a mandatory insurance scheme that every single smart device will have to join, will to be part of, before it can be deployed into the real world. And so in this sense, in the event of an accident, then the, the smart device will actually be able to pay for the damages that it has caused to other people according to a liability rule. And so this actually reinforces the issue of algorithm go alter algorithmic governance because essentially this means that those, um, those algorithmical rules are progressively replacing the rules of law to the extent that those smart devices do not actually need to abide by the law as long as they can actually pay for the crimes that they have committed. And so, to conclude, um, the Internet of Things uh, obviously provides uh, enormous opportunity in terms of efficiency, of personalization and comfort for the user, but it is really important that we actually understand what are the costs that this might entail in terms of privacy and security and um, individual agency or autonomy. And so, if we want to avoid that the Internet of Things actually be turned into yet another tool for uh, mass surveillance and control, then it becomes extremely important that uh, we retain control not only over our personal data, but also over our personal devices. And so that's it, and I hope you have questions. Thank you so much. Uh, let me invite Alison and Kate to join us here in the front, and then we can take a few questions about all the presentations. Well, oops. I think I'm destroying everything like that. Okay, okay, well, a as you prefer, but like a, there's three chairs. Okay, so with that, let's open the floor for questions. So if you have questions or comments, you should be welcome to do that now. Don't be shy. Julie. Just a quick question. I'm curious what you guys are interested in looking at the Brazilian context of your work. So I'm, I'm personally interested um, because I've actually heard that uh, the Internet of Things is actually becoming a big thing in Brazil, and uh, I'm particularly interested in seeing how this kind of um, regulation by the technology can actually be used in order. So, for instance, uh, um, in the case of uh, the um, the protest, uh, supposedly it seems that uh, Brazil has actually used specific technique in order to understand who people, who will the people that might actually uh, go into the protest and actually arrest them beforehand. And so this is all these um, 
this new question of like what happened when we have all those sensors and all those devices that are regulating the society and because of some algorithmical uh, justification which have which cannot be proved in any way then we actually stop taking action on the life of individuals which actually have not done anything yet you know so um, I'm not sure how is uh, Brazil actually what what's the actual direction of Brazil uh, for this but I think it's really important to raise the issue right now and start thinking about this in order to avoid that it actually goes in this direction because I think that's a great question and it matches well with the Internet of Things description that you gave. At the Marco Civil, the law that we have passed in Brazil, there is a mandatory provision about data retention. So if you imagine that each one of these devices will be connected to the network and generating data, you will have to store the data for all those devices. And they might be like billions of devices uh, sending data like to a server somewhere and which they should be stored for at least one year, and basically making a retrospective of people's lives in a very detail detailed way. So we at ITS, we have been supporting that there should be an exception at the Marco Civil regarding devices. So for two reasons. One, for not uh, harming the future development of the Internet of Things industry. And the second reason is because of privacy and also because of the amount of data to be stored. Because if you're talking about billions of devices collecting and generating data all the time, you'll be recording those logs, uh, and this is like a massive amount of data that to be recorded. So basically, we have been having this point, and I think it matches well with your presentation. Would you like to take on Julie's question? Yeah. So. Um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of interested in two things. One is about this idea of civic engagement, and one is about the idea of participatory kind of lawmaking or community-based lawmaking. So we're, we're here in large part to learn um, what happened throughout the whole Marco Civil process and to think about um, what impact it's had so far. And so from the perspective of engagement, I'm curious to understand um, what was it that motivated so many people to offer substantive commentary towards this particular issue and this particular format by which I mean an online platform plus the in-person meetings um, and and whether that squares with what we've learned recently from the US context and so one of the things that we're seeing emerge about why people engage is that it has to do with prior personal experiences or, or personal expertise, that there's something about the issue that speaks to their own experiences. It has to do with feeling like you have an interest at stake and you want to protect your interests or fight against the interests of others. Um, and it has to do with some kind of emotional fulfillment, that there's some kind of emotional reason why you're engaging on a particular sort of civic or public issue. And so I'm interested to kind of understand were those similar drivers for people who participated in the Marco Civil process and other kinds of political and, and um, social um, mobilizations that are happening now, or if there are other reasons? And also just from the perspective of how kind of governance and lawmaking happens, that it was so notable that this process around this particular topic at this particular moment in time had such a participatory um, kind of experience and I'm comparing that to a lot of the lawmaking that happens in the US context and I don't see that same level of participation and I wonder is it the topic if we were talking about internet and society in this way with this platform would we have a similar result or is it something about this moment in time the country context all of these different kinds of factors about how and why people's input can be channeled into formal lawmaking. Um, so that's sort of my interest in the, in the Brazilian context. Um, yeah, I actually was really impressed when we went to Brasilia at um, the, at least the number of politicians who said they were there as public servants or made some sort of connotation thereof because I feel like that's very different in the American context, which is um, mainly informed by corporate lobbyists. Um, and then regarding One thing that I'm interested in looking at is like what 
just kind of what does that what does that mean for democracy when there's a law that's passed when not even everyone has access to this? Um, how how democratic is that? Um, in other words, you know, what what is the divide between those who, when technology is moving forward at such a fast pace, who doesn't get access to that? Um, but otherwise, I've been really really impressed and really fascinated by everything. Perguntas? Ok, vamos lá. Uh, I guess my question is mostly for Allison. Um, I was just curious about your illuminator. Where, where do you get the data to illuminate things? And oh, I deleted that slide. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I just, um, I don't know if you went over talking, but... Yeah, that's, uh, there's... Let me give you the microphone, otherwise it's hard to get caught. Oh, unless you don't want to be on record on that. <laughs> Actually, work. <laughs> sorry for the technical. Field. So, we need another microphone. Hello, hello. the old wired brain. That's a good question. I'm sorry. Um, so, there's a, a non profit organization called Little Sis, um, and they call themselves the involuntary Facebook of the 1%. So Little Sis is the opposite of Big Brother. Um, and so that's where I got all the Fortune 1000 board members. And then another, the Sunlight Labs is also another nonprofit that um, give information like that. Wikipedia's list of lists and the li list of tech acquisitions. And then the Columbia Journalism Law Review. Um, so I make no promises that the data is correct as of now, but as of like, April. So it's difficult. Well, I think everyone has to have wants to have beer apparently. So <laughs> let's do the following. It's uh, six o'clock. Let's go to the veranda. Grab our beers and be back here at 6.15, alright? You can bring the beers inside and drink as much as you want. Okay, so let's do that.